Fast. Fast and what is efficient? Use of resources. Like a time limit. Time limit, yeah, time limited. Efficient re use of resources. Doing more with less. Yeah, doing more with less. Right? Be careful about your definitions. Watch the words. That also means doing more with less. Okay? Efficient use of resources. According to whom? Who defines the efficiency rate? If you close files faster than anyone else, does that mean you're better? No. Maybe not. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't, but it, it doesn't it doesn't mean you're better. Doesn't mean anything until you find out whether the quality of your care is excellent. Right? Case management supports the client's achievement of safe, realist, let's start with safe, of safe goals. Who dictates what's safe? We're back to Mr. Nobody. Were his goals safe? Oh, yeah. No, really not. He lived in a, a disorganized household with paints and, and cats. cats, how many cats? And stairs that were narrow that he could hardly climb. He had difficulty walking and his stability was poor and it was an unhygienic house and there was dirt everywhere and the food was bad and on and on and on and on and on. But who dictates whether that's safe or not? Because he, your client, thinks that's safe enough. So there's a piece as a case coordinator that we struggle with is our definition of what safe is versus their definition of the right to live the way they want to live. Okay. So safe, realistic, and reasonable goals. So you have a client who says, I want to, I want to be a doctor. I want to go back to school and be a doctor. Okay. But your client is 55. He has academic issues. He's never scored more than a C. He doesn't like to study. But he likes the income that doctors make. Is that a realistic goal? No. Is that person going to achieve that goal? Right. So you may have to have a dialogue about what's a realistic goal and also listen that active listening that you do in your interviewing and interpersonal skills is it you want to be a doctor or you want to make more money there are other ways to do that that are achievable but this one probably not okay so you have to have that realistic conversation with your clients about what is achievable and what do they really want okay and reasonable goals okay so again is it reasonable at 55 years of age where you've never done, you, you haven't finished high school, you never scored more than a C, you don't like to study, you don't want to put the effort in. I'm not saying at 55 years of age you can't go back and become a doctor. You absolutely can. I'm not saying that you can't become a doctor if you don't finish high school. You absolutely can. I'm not even saying that you can't become a doctor if you got C's because if you had an LD that was undiagnosed that you now know how to overcome or there was a poverty issue and you've overcome all that or you had personal issues that you've overcome, you may be an A-plus student and you can become a doctor. But if you're not going to work at it, if you don't want to do the work for it, you're not going to become a doctor. There's no magic wand. Okay? So there are pieces there that you have to listen actively to see, okay, what is achievable and what is not based on what your client is saying and what is it they really want, what are they really expressing from what they're saying. Because clients sometimes don't articulate what they really want. Sometimes they're very articulate, they're very clear about what they want, but sometimes they're not. Okay? Um, so goals with complex health issues, social issues, and fiscal issues. And many of your clients will have multiple issues. It won't just be a case of financial issues, or it won't be just be a case of relationships or social issues. 
it won't just be a case of health issues. They're generally all mixed in together. So planning becomes this process of teasing out into the six domains that you're going to learn about. Teasing out what are the goals here and what domains do they fall in and what's a priority and what do we need to do first and how do we need to do it. And you have to break it down into manageable chunks and we'll talk about that later in the course. So that's the definition. In your case management document, your national case standards, you have guiding principles. You should know this for your quiz. You have case management supports, um, case managers supports clients' rights. Case management is purposeful. Case management is collaborative. Case management supports accountability. And case management strives for cultural competency. Let's go to the case management standards and find out what all this means. Where's my blackboard? So in our case management standards, wow, that's big. And you guys, if you have your laptops, you can um, go along with me with this. Okay, it's page eight. So on page eight of the, um, the document, if you have, like I said, if you have your laptop, follow along. You have definitions for client supporting rights. I'll make it a little bigger, because I can see that it's not. Is that big enough? Does that work? Is that too large? Okay, so case management supports clients' rights. Case manager supports the rights of clients within a funding and legislative framework. What does that mean? The funding that they receive and the government uh, regulations. That regulates it. So what if the funding is substandard? Or the rules are unjust? Now what do you do? Right? There was a time when if you were gay, it was illegal to be gay. It was a criminal act. But it was within the legislative framework. Does that seem right to you? No. No. So there are some advocacy strategies we're going to talk about later on. And you're going to have to make decisions about is the law itself a just law? Is it a fair law? Because for what you do with your clients, it may not be. The regulations around mar marijuana use, are they just or unjust? Does it service your client's needs? If your client medically needs marijuana, there was a time when you couldn't get it. It was illegal and yet it was the best a substance to use in order to alleviate your pain. Is it a just law? Okay. So these are the ethical considerations when we're talking about supporting clients' rights. To what extent are you going to com support the client's rights? Because you have your own rights too. You don't have to break the law for your client if you don't feel that that's right. Okay. But the law itself may be wrong. So you have to make some de personal decisions around that. Case management is purposeful. So the actions of case managers must address the specific needs of clients as documented in their goals. So don't go beyond what your client wants. So if your client has an addiction and they want to learn to drink moderately, so they want to use a harm reduction model, but you think the only way they're going to kick this habit is sobriety, is, is abstinence, and you push AA and abstinence on them, are you meeting their goals? Or are you going beyond what they want? Or better yet, back to an addictions model, if a client doesn't want help, but you call in the, the cavalry and you drag them, you trick them and drag them to AA and you 
trick them with an intervention and you force them to get detoxed and help. It can work, but are you going beyond the client's goals that the client said, I'm not ready to do this? So what are the chances of relapse? They already tell you statistically very high. Relapse rates are very high when it's a forced intervention. They're not ready. And you've gone beyond their goal. That was not their goal. This is not going to be successful. Okay? It may be the first step. It may be a wake-up call. But it's unlikely to be successful. Percentages of interventions and success rates after one um, round of detox and rehab, very low. Which is why we're looking at empowerment models now and harm reduction models. Um, case management is collaborative. So we, this, this word collaborative, we're hearing it again. That's working with the community. When you're in placement, one of the things you're going to do this year is network. Because it matters to know enough people and know the right people and know the agencies that you work with and that your client needs and what they provide and who works there and is this a good agency. It's collaborative. You're working with a team. If you work with children in a school setting, who's going to be on your team? Who's likely to be on that team for an at-risk child in school? Guidance. Hmm? A guidance counselor. Guidance counselor? The social service worker or social worker? Who else? A nurse, maybe? CYW. CYW? Teacher? Principal? Maybe a lawyer? Certainly the parents or the guardians, the legal guardians. It could be, it could be the state. They could be in foster care and CAS or CCAS or JF and CS or any one of the child services may be involved. Ten people. Ten people. Okay. And you are working with them collaboratively to create a plan. Okay? Case management supports accountability. So this is about service delivery that you are able to coordinate in a timely manner that you document. So remember the accountability piece here. Documentation is very important. Doing things on time is very important. Tracking your actions is important. Calling people back is important in a timely manner. Everything in a timely manner. If your voice message says, I will return calls to you within 48 hours or 72 hours, you better return that call in 72 hours. Okay. But if your message says, I will get back to you, when do you think that client's expecting that call? Never. Never Either never or what's the other one? Right, right away. Right away, because you said, I'll get back to you. Okay. And aren't we used to that in our society? When somebody texts you, how fast do you text back? Pretty quick. And if you want, has anybody ever felt that, like this, converse, this texting conversation is going on too long? How do I stop this? I can't just stop. And I keep trying to smiley face, smiley face. Smiley face means goodbye. Right? Last night I had that smiley face. I'm, I just want to go. Z, Z face, icon Z face, Z, 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 sleeping. Stop texting me, don't say good night, I don't care, stop. Okay, right, so we're expecting in this society really quick responses. So do our clients. We need to set up a standard for them, a context of when they can expect us to respond. So if you say, look, this is gonna take me a week to do, that's fine. Don't just say, I'll get this done. Because then they're expecting it tomorrow. Give them timelines. Okay. I tell my clients in my private practice with my cases, I want you to do these three things within two weeks. By the end of two weeks, you'll come back and see me. Don't come back and see me unless you've done this homework. Yes, I give my clients homework too. Everybody gets homework. Okay. But I give them a time frame. I tell them I can get this report done for you in two weeks, but I need it tonight. I can't do it tonight. You're giving me three hours notice. I'm sorry. Not doable. That's where you set up your boundary. Okay. So give them 
Accountability is about setting timelines, doing things within the frame of time you're supposed to do them in, spending the appropriate amount of money, not overspending, not underspending, even though the government really likes you to underspend. Okay, looking at achieving their goals, making sure the goals are good goals, are smart goals, that the objectives are achievable, just like your learning contract. It really does reflect the same kind of plan. Um, that you're taking care of yourself because the more stressed you are, the more sick you get. How many people got sick last semester in final exams? Winter, never mind summers. How many people got sick over the winter final exams? That's typical, the stress levels are high, you're not eating right, you're not sleeping right, your clients are under the same kind of stress, but so are you as a case coordinator. And if you're off sick all the time, you're unreliable because you're not there and your client needs you. Okay? So taking care of yourself, and we're gonna talk about self-care in the course, how do you take care of yourself? Okay. Because if you know ways to take care of yourself, your client's gonna also want that. They're gonna wanna know how do you take care of yourself versus how do I take care of myself. The standards, very quickly, and I'm gonna leave you to read the content of the, the actual document for the, the National Case Standards, um, Case Management Network Standards. You're gonna read the part about client identification, which is the first standard, and you need to know this for the quiz. So client identification and eligibility for case management. This is almost like phases. Their standards are really phases of case management. So eligibility for case management services and identification, what does that really mean? What is that? How does that translate in your agency or your work? What stage is that of this process, case management process? Like, it shows that is the client eligible? Yeah, when do you do this? At what point do you do, do you, I take um, contact demographic data like contact information, address, and assess for their eligibility for services. When does that happen? Right away. Right away, first thing. Yeah, right away. So phase one. So just think of the case standards as phases. So the first phase is identification and eligibility. And then under the standards, there are certain expectations that a case manager has. And there's, the expectations are listed in the book. So do you want me to flip to a couple of them? I'll flip to a couple of them. So in the book, Zoom. There it is. So here are the, for standard one, case managers are expected for standard one on eligibility and identification to ensure that individual clients understand their rights and responsibilities. What do we also call that? To understand the services that are offered, the limits of the services offered, whether there's fees for service, whether there's a wait list, describing the services to our client, describing their rights, describing yours, telling them your limits of confidentiality. What is that all called? In, I heard consent. What type of consent? Informed consent. That's big. Informed consent. Good. So informed consent is a part of that first process. So before they open their mouth and say, my name is, you probably want to give them their rights because they may go from, hi, my name is, and then you start to get into a dialogue and suddenly you find out that they're telling you a child's at risk for neglect or abuse and you're having to breach. And they said, I didn't know that was part of the rules because you never got to this, what your limits of confidentiality are. You never got it in there. That's happened. It happened to me. It's really ugly when that happens. Your client's very unhappy because I had to breach and I didn't get a chance to do the informed consent portion before they launched into the problem and I went, oh, this is a child's at risk for neglect and abuse and now I have to call the authorities, CAS, and get them involved and the client was very upset. And I had to apologize, I'm sorry, but you launched into it before I could stop you and it was my fault. I should have said, stop, I have to do this thing first stop, please, let me say this first, and then you can talk. Because then the client has a choice as to whether to tell you or not, and they do have that right. They have the right to choose to tell you this information or not. If they know that your confidential, the limits of your confidentiality, they may not tell you. 
You may not like that they're not telling you. You can't trap them into telling you. That's wrong. But they know their rights. If they don't tell you, you don't know there's no breach. Or they may choose to tell you anyways. It's up to them, right? Um, gathering required information about the clients while respecting their confidentiality and privacy. Like Pahippa says, you can only gather the information that's relevant for what you're going to do. You can't ask them questions about stuff that has nothing to do with anything. So if you don't, if your agency doesn't require their income, you are, don't have the right to ask about it. But if the if eligibility depends on whether they are their income status, if eligibility depends on their income status, then you have to know. So if you're applying for Ontario Works, you have to ask them, what's their income? What are their assets, right? Because otherwise they're not going to get Ontario Works. That's an eligibility regulation. They, they have to know. The agency has to know how much money are you making. You may not be eligible. They may have to know your citizenship status. What's your status? because you may not be eligible because you're a visa student, right? Or you have no status. So they have the right to ask certain questions. Are you pregnant and you're applying for OW? M may be relevant, may not be. If you're applying for maternity and paternity leave, relevant. If you're applying for some job at OW, they don't have the right to ask you whether you're pregnant or not because that's a question of whether you're eligible for hire. Okay? So it depends on what the eligibility rules of your agency are. So that's your demographic data that you gather, explaining case management process to each client, so how many sessions are they gonna get, how long are the sessions gonna be, how often are the sessions gonna be, do the sessions cost, what's gonna happen in the sessions, all of that is part of this eligibility standard. And there's more, but let's move on. There's the assessment standard. So assessment comes next, also known as engagement. So in terms of assessment, you can go on your own to the what are the stand what's the standard definition and what's the rationale. But I would rather know you know the expectations for the quiz. So what are the expectations? So let's go to case manager's expectations for assessment. <coughs> So in the document, there's that high-pitched sound again. Okay. So in the document, the guidelines here are the case manager engages in a collaborative process in which the case manager seeks to guide the early identification of goals. So in the assessment process, you're not planning yet, but you're trying to figure out what the general goals are. Respect the client's um, right to self-determination. What does that mean? Client's right to self-determination. They, they have the right to determine it themselves. Yeah, whatever they want to do. Whatever their goals are, they have the right to set their own goals. So even though you think you know better, you can suggest it as an option, certainly because they may not have thought of it as an option, but if they dismiss your option or your suggestion and they want something else, that's what you go with, as long as it's safe and reasonable. If their suggestion is that they want to murder somebody else, not safe, not reasonable, right? That's just outside of the plan. That's not the plan you're trying to develop with them. But if it's safe and reasonable enough, it's not hurting anyone else, you may not think it's the best goal, but that's not up to you. That's up to the client. Okay, so assessment is about figuring out what are their, what do they want as their goals, letting them know that they're determining their own goals, understanding what their needs and their concerns are, understanding their cultural components, what are their value and belief systems, what is their perception of the world and their belief in the world and what they think of the world, because all of that matters. Are they optimistic, pessimistic? Does religion play a very large role in the way they view the world, in their belief system, in how they act, um, do their, react and act and perceive the world? So all of that helps you. You can't ask them their religion unless they divulge it to you or 
it's part of an eligibility piece, which I can't understand why religion would ever be a part of an eligibility piece. But they may say something like they speak Gurjarati. Well, if you speak Gurjarati, you're from Gurjarat, I think it's called, which is part of India. So you can make some assumptions that they have that culture or they come from that culture or maybe even have moved. You may need to know whether they're a newcomer or not. They, you may ask them a question, does culture and religion matter when we're service planning? They can say yes it matters to me or no it doesn't. If you're doing dietary, if you're creating a dietary plan for somebody, culture and religion might matter. What are the issues with culture and religion and dietary concerns? Um, yeah. Some religions can't eat pork. Some religions can't eat seafood. Some religions can't mix meat with milk. Okay, so religi some religions don't drink alcohol. These pieces matter when you're developing a plan. But your first question would probably be, does your religion or culture, do, or do religious and cultural concerns matter in this service plan? Is there something I need to know? If they don't want to disclose that, they have the right not to disclose it. But if you serve them pork and they didn't disclose that this is a dietary religious issue, you can apologize and now you know and you'll put it on the thing, but they didn't disclose it, you didn't know it, you had asked them, it's on the file. Okay, so you just update the file. Apply knowledge that reflects the general need of the client population while capturing the individu individuality of specific client needs. So you're working in Regent Park. No, you're working in Rexdale. And there's a specific culture and a specific community there. And is Rexdale the equivalent socio socioeconomic status of Rosedale? No. So you're working in a specific socioeconomic status and you know about the community. You've been working there for years. You come from that community. You live in that community. But you also work in it. You're aware of the community's needs. So even though you're working, like I said before, as an individual, one-to-one -one basis, private troubles, public issues, you also know there are macro pieces of knowledge that you have that can help develop this plan and discuss something you can bring into the dialogue around yes I know this is an individual issue for you but did you know there's this group that meets that also are single pregnant teenage moms or that there's this group of, um, of poverty rights activists who are working towards change and maybe you want to be a part of that. So knowing what's in the community and understanding that the larger issues also apply to your individual clients is important. Moving on to the next standard, so we move from intake to assessment and now we move to planning. So how is planning achieved? Let's look at the planning standard. So there's planning, clients goals and priorities are documented and reflected in the strategy for action agreed upon by the, between the client and the manager. Case managers are expected to respond to clients own assessment of his or her needs. I would like to learn to drink less. Your response isn't, oh you mean drink, don't drink at all? No, less. Oh, not at all. No less. Well there's this AA group and the client responds, well AA is abstinence. I want to learn to drink less. Am I as a case manager hearing this client? No. Is this service plan going to work? No. I'm going to recommend they go to AA and practice abstinence and they're not going to go to AA and they're going to drink more because they're angry and they're upset and disappointed that the system is broken. Okay, and not listening to them. Uh, provide the client with comprehensive explanations of options for current circumstances. So you're going to give them, while you're doing the service plan, these are the options for your current situation. You also have to learn to prioritize. A client comes in and says, I want a job. Where do you live? In a shelter. What do they need first? 
Uh, shelter, yeah, permanent housing, right? And they're not on OW. Where are you getting your income? I don't know, I just panhandle. I don't get anything from anywhere. What do they need? They need an application for OW. Or if they have a disability, ODSP. There are things they need before they can get a job. So yes, you're hearing them. Yes, your long-term goal, we're gonna get you a job. But before we get you a job, there are these few things that probably need to be done first, like you need a house, you need food, you need to apply for an income for the system to support you. You need an education in whatever you're going to work in. If you want to become a chef and you don't have any education, you're probably going to need to go to school first. So it's a great long-term goal. And then what are all these other goals that are priorities? You have to assess for what are their needs, what are their priorities. Um, ascertaining clear understanding of the services and choices available so that the client continues to be an informed decision maker. So when you're sending a client to a link program and the link program is on the other side of town and the transit, it's a dark stop and the transit doesn't stop right there, which is unlikely. Links programs are usually connected right by the bus stops. Um, and it's at a time when the client can't attend how effective is that resource? Not very. Or you send a client who speaks Cantonese to an agency that's around the corner. It's easy to get to for um, a group on a group support self-help group. And it's around the corner, but they all speak Mandarin. Is that helpful? What have we done? We've massively assumed that all Asians speak the same language. Right? Bad. Very bad. Okay? So we need to, during the planning, plan appropriately for the client. Just because a resource is around the corner doesn't mean it's appropriate. Okay? Or else forewarn them, look. You know, Manchang is an Asian facility, but primarily Cantonese speaking. And you speak Mandarin, so you should know that. And let them make their decision as to whether that's okay. Often you'll see the client, the client will say, you know what, that's okay. It's close enough. At least they can read the same, right? So you probably wouldn't be advised to send someone who speaks Korean or who's from Korea to Monshang because they don't speak the same language and they don't have the same writing and nothing's the same. Okay, so that's that massive bias, prejudiced assumptions that you don't really mean to be, but you really are. Okay, so be careful what you're doing and make sure they're informed and they can make the final decision whether they want to be at that, use that resource or not. And then consider, among others, these specific decision issues. When you're planning, you have to consider safety. You have to consider risk to client and risk to others. So let's say you're working with a client um, who has a history of violence, who's working through an anger management program, and they're, on, they're out on parole. They've finished their, their sentence, and they're, they, they, they're in a halfway home, and they're looking they're getting a job, everything's working well, and they want to move out independently. And so you're developing a plan for them to move into independent living. And they decide they want a very specific area in which they're looking to live. You also know that their ex lives in that area, the person they beat up and went to prison for. Is that safe? Is that safe for others? So you may want to have a bit of a confrontational discussion. And if you don't know how to do confrontation, confrontational interviewing, Summers has a great chapter on it. But you want to do a confrontational interview with your client about why do they want to live in that area and that their ex is in that area and remind them of their history and probably not a good choice and that you're not going to help them live in that area, right? Okay, so that's what they mean. 
financial and human resources so they have to you have to consider is this a fee for service resource that you're sending them to what's you know what's happening with this resource timelines of access and implementation so how long are they going to have to wait to get this resource so Toronto housing what's the average wait list for Toronto housing if you're not a female a single mother with children years. how many years? Ten, years 10 years seven years yeah mm -hmm. long time Okay. Who's going to live in a shelter for seven to ten years? You might have to look at alternatives. Okay. And requirements for sharing client information with others. So reminding them, look, as I'm sending you to all these resources, they may need certain parts of your file. They may need information. I need written consent to allow, to allow me to send them specific parts of your information. And a client can either lockbox certain information, PIHIPA, remember lockbox? Or they can say, you know, you can send whatever, here's my release form. These are the things you can send. But you have to get that consent for release in writing. Verbal is, eh, writing is better. Okay, that's part of the file. Then we go to the next standard, so the next phase Implementation. So now you've made your plan, which you're going to learn how to do in this course. Now you're going to implement it. So what does implementation mean? So let's look at some of the implement expectations for implementation. You all look riveted. Implementation. Plan, services, resources, and supports are initiated. That's the, a that's the active term, that they're initiated. So you've made the plan. Now you have to initiate it. You have to put it into action. So there are, case managers are expected to initiate and build relationships to incur, um, ensure client-centered approach. So your relationships that you're building aren't just with your client, they're with whom? With the resources you're sending them to. So when I send a client to a resource, I usually call up the resource first, optimally, over the years, I've gotten to know that resource. In fact, I've gone over there to say hi, or we've done workshops together, or something that clicks us so that when I pick up the phone and call them, they know who I am, and I know who they are. And I say, I'm sending this person over, or I ask them, do you have room for this person, or is this person appropriate? And they'll tell me, and they know who I am. That also helps with the transition for clients who are going to that resource. If I say to them, listen, Jennifer works at this, ask for Jennifer. Jennifer's the one who runs the group, tell her I sent you. Doesn't a client feel better when you give them a name and they know that, that you know that person and that person knows you? I don't know, has anybody ever had that feeling where you've been told go to see this person and tell them I sent you? It's relieving, it's like okay, things are gonna get done. I'm special, right? It matters, so networking again matters. So when you're implementing, building relationships in order to optimize this client-centered care matters. Um, outlining and facilitate agreements on roles and responsibilities. So you're going to, in your groups, when you do um, the service planning, is the client responsible for some of this? Am I responsible for it? Is a friend gonna do some of it? Who's gonna do what? And depending on whether you're going to do empowerment model or not, the, if you're going to do an empowerment model, your client's going to do almost everything. In fact, your client's going to do everything. If you're going to do a traditional model, usually the case manager winds up doing most of the work. Okay? It's the ringing's driving me nuts. Um, you're trying to foster client independence, arrange group discussions and decision-making sessions if appropriate and when appropriate. You want to monitor the not client's needs and preferences. How is that? Last semester, who did some referring to other resources to and then finding out, you know, how was this? How did it work? I, I'm not sure. You have to be in the community sector for this, where it's, how is that resource? Is it helping you? Is it a quality place? Should I send other people there? Or else they gave you feedback. This place is great. You should send more people here. I get from my private practice, I might send somebody to a new place. I'll warn them, look, I don't know anybody here. This is a new program. Try it out. I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't know whether it's going to be good or bad. You can say that. That's fair. And then they can make a choice as to whether to try it out or not. And I've had clients try a place out and say, 
thumbs down, don't ever send me there again. Sorry, okay, good to know. And I've had other clients come in and say, this place is fabulous and give me all these pamphlets and tell other clients about this, this really works. So your client can give you feedback on, how, on the resource that you use for them. Um, address and facilitate and res resolve discordant issues. You've implemented the plan and somehow parts of the plan are not working. So you have to address those. What's going on here? Why is this, why are, you, you set this goal and you're not meeting it. What's happening? Or it's, we set this goal and you're not meeting it. Well, maybe you set the goal as the case manager and they don't want it, but they said yes. Okay, watch for compliancy. You don't want compliancy. That's a client who just says yes, sure, whatever, because they want to make you happy. They don't want to, they, they, they want to avoid conflict. Those are the harder clients to work with because they look like you've set out this plan, you've done all this work and it just doesn't happen. When you implement, it, it falls flat because they didn't actually want it. And you took away their voice. These are clients that actually need to practice on working to use their voice. Okay. We're almost finished this part. Evaluation. Again, evaluation is, go back to the standards, evaluation is very simple. You're evaluating the plan. Do you need to change it? Do you need to adjust the goals, increase the goals, track more? What, what is it that you need to do with this plan? Is the client happy with the plan? Is the client progressing through the plan? That's the biggest part, is, is the client actually progressing and meeting the goals? If not, why not, and how do we change this? Okay. Then you have transition. Transition, another word for transition is termination. So this is finally you get to a point with the client where your services are done. So the case manager is expected to make sure that the goals that are supposed to be met were met. If they weren't met, why weren't they met? Do they need to know whether they can come back again? Are they allowed to come back for services at a later date? Do they have any anxiety over ending this service and dealing with that ending because many clients have trouble with endings. Um, are, you trans are you terminating services and closing the file and leaving them to the wind? Are you sending them, are you giving them links and recommendations to in general what's out there? Or are you actually transferring them to another resource where you're facilitating the transfer? Which means sending documents and referral documents and information to another resource and ensuring that they get to that resource and that that resource is working for them. That's your transition, okay? So those are the standards. One last thing. <sighs> self-care. In small groups, I have copied for you the self-care from Summers. What's it called? Self-care something or other. Taking care of yourself. In small groups, um, I have eight of these self-care things. Go through the document and Find out how do you take care of yourself? How do you achieve the goals you want? Um, there's questions to prompt you and have a discussion for 15 minutes. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Phase out. How do I press pause? How do I phase out? Pause?